Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak at this opening session of the fifth anniversary of the Women Empowerment Principles. Uh, as Joanne said, I'm um, Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner. Uh, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner is a statutory office in Australia. I sit independently of government and of business and civil society. In fact, when I was appointed a few, a few years ago, I came home to tell my 14-year-old son, I said, guess what, Tom? Mum's going to be Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner. <laughs> well, he looked at me, he said, Mum, that is so gross, he said. <laughs> Um, but one of the things I'm doing in my role as Sex Discrimination Commissioner is to work very closely with the business and corporate sector to advance gender equality. And as all of you will know in the room, there's no single strategy to advance gender equality in any of our countries. It requires multiple and complex strategies. Um, and not just multiple and complex strategies, but we need the involvement of all sectors. With the number of women on the ASX, so the top 200 boards increasing by almost 50% in that two year period, 2010 to 2012. Um, we're still embarrassingly low, 15.4% of board directorships of ASX 200 companies are filled by women. But it is a significant increase given we only increased 0.2% in the previous decade. And for some of you who attended Mari Steele, my colleague's presentation yesterday, the other thing that we've done and the Australian government done is to um, introduce very strong workplace gender equality laws, um, particularly directed at all organisations with 100 or more employees. So while these two initiatives have been really welcome, an area where we're doing very poorly is in the number of women at senior executive level. So not the board so much, but the senior executive level. And it's no surprise why that might be. Um, part of it is that to create a critical mass of women at senior executive level requires significant cultural evolution. It's difficult to do in most businesses because there are structures and conventions that continue to function as a, barriers, a barrier to women's workforce participation. That's what I call the cycle of absence in Australia. So in my work I've particularly focused on how we can use the WEPs and really the intent underpinning the WEPs um, to compel particularly male leaders in business to create cultural change. Now you might say to me, well why are you focused on men? And the reason for that is the more I've been in the role as Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner, it occurs to me that to deliver equality for women, we actually have to focus on men. Um, let's face it, the site of organisational power sits with men. If you look at any organisation across uh, pre pretty much all our countries, the fact is, and particularly if you look at business, both the human and financial resources are controlled by men. So placing the onus on women to fix the problem of women's underrepresentation means that any failures will then be laid at the door of women rather than identified as systemic deficiencies. So that's why about two years ago I established a group called the Male Champions of Change, which is a senior leadership group in Australia. Um, and it's a group that's taken the women's empowerment principles and brought them to life through collaboration and through innovative strategies. And I just want to talk a little bit about that today. So the male champions of change are 24 of Australia's most powerful and influential men. They're the heads of our iconic companies like Qantas, like Telstra, like the Commonwealth Bank, like Woolworths. They're the heads of men who lead global organisations like Citibank, like Goldman Sachs, like Credit Suisse. They're men who hold the most senior roles in government and they're the most senior leaders of our military. So you've got to be prepared to step up and be a national advocate on this issue across Australia and also globally. Um, and it's been the most amazing strategy. I mean, the group meets very regularly. Uh, and aside from driving change in their own organisations, from the military to the government to the iconic companies, they have been strong advocates, not just nationally but globally. Just to give you an idea of that, they've spoken at more than 80 events in the last six months, not just across Australia, but across New Zealand. We've been to Washington with Eileen, um, to Brazil, up to the Middle East. And in fact, even to this meeting here at the CSW, the Chief of Army, who is one of the male champions of change, is travelling with me 
this year into CSW to talk about um, his experiences in transforming, let's face it, the most hyper-masculine culture that exists in any of our countries, and that is the military as a male champion of change. And if you're interested, he's speaking at the International Women's Day lunch um, in the North Lawn building on Friday on International Women's Day. But the good thing is we've seen a spawning of other groups across the country. Um, so groups established of male champions in Western Australia, South Australia, New Zealand, sector-based groups in infrastructure, in engineering, in the built environment. And the models being adopted in a number of cu countries, particularly emerging economies and countries where there are no women at senior levels. And if men aren't advocating for change, how will change happen? Just to tell you, the first thing that the men did when they came together is they decided to write to every business leader in Australia to make the case for change and to reflect on their own experience in increasing the, women's, the representation of women in leadership. And they launched this, uh, this letter at a huge event where they invited in all their male peers. So there was hundreds of men from around Australia. It was a historic moment with all these men up on the stage advocating for women's leadership. Um, and to date, they've distributed around 150,000 copies of their letter. Um, so this year, they've really upped the ante and they're working on a series of what they called game-changing ideas. I mean, you'd have to call it that as a male champion, wouldn't you? Um, it's probably ideas you and I come up with every day, but you know, there you are. Um, <laughs> but it's essentially a series of monitored experiments to see what kinds of things, different, bold things can be done to really shift the dial on gender inequality. Um, and what I find interesting is how most of these ideas align to one of the webs. So just to give you an example, the first area that they're working is around principle one, and that's establishing high-level corporate leadership. And there was a realisation last year amongst the group that, hey, we have access and levers of power and influence that most other people don't have in this country as CEOs and leaders. So what they're doing over the last six months, some of them are a group because I've broken them into three groups of eight. So one group's really exploring models of leadership that promote gender equality. So they're analysing four elements. They're mining their diaries to see where they spend their time, what they prioritise, what they measure, how they act and how they speak. Um, and uh, they've conducted consultations with employees on their leadership approach. And what they've done is, based on research and with some help from McKinsey's and others, they've developed a model for the most effective leadership of a, for a CEO that's doing this well. And they're devising a transition plan from where they are to where they want to be. And they're cascading that through their organisation. Um, in relation to another area, which is principle two, they're working on making visible bias and harmful stereotypes that prevent the status quo from changing. How are they doing that? They're doing something really simple. 50-50, if not, why not? So they're saying if women make up 50% of the Australian population, and I point out, actually, we're in the majority, 50.8%, but, you know, who's counting? Um, but if women make up 50%, why am I not seeing 50% of them in the graduate intake, 50% of them on the leadership development course, 50% of them at senior level? And by posing this question, they confront old norms and ask why not instead of why. And I think when you start to apply that lens to an organisation, you elevate the discussion about some of the erroneous long-held assumptions, assumptions which you can then debunk either as myths or identify as true barriers to women's progression and decide to do something about it. Um, they're also having the hard conversations in their organisation. And uh, one group of eight has held in the last month 30 consultations within their organisation. So what they do is two CEOs buddy up together. So the head of the Treasury may come together with the head of Deloitte's, for example. Deloitte's are one of our male champions. Um, and they go into their organisation and they hold a number of conversations. Some of them are men's only conversations. And as one CEO told me last week, he said he was asked in consultation from one of quite senior men who said to him, so tell me, um, what I'm hearing is that from now on it's going to be harder 
for me as a man to get ahead in this organisation? Is that what I'm really hearing? To which he replied, well, yeah, actually, you're probably right, but think of it this way, how hard has it been for women for the last 200 years? So it's an interesting conversation that really only the CEO can have, I think, um, with senior members of their staff. And then a further area is in relation to principle seven, gender reporting. I mean, one of the main things this group of men want to do is they want to take the lead on gender reporting. They want to go beyond what's required by Australian law. And as a collective, they're taking, they have taken the view that if we are serious about this, Every leader in Australia should have some sort of gender balance target in their scorecard, ideally tied to a remuneration outcome. And this includes not just in corporate, but includes in government and most importantly in the military. Um, and that's what they're working towards. So that's the Male Champions of Change strategy. It's been a bit of a controversial strategy, I have to say. People have said to me, oh, are you suggesting, Liz, that we women are waiting to be saved by corporate knights in shining armour, galloping paternalistically into territory that women have always held? Well, I have to say it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, as one of the champions said, he said, look, the rules of work have been invented by men for men. If we want to change it, we need to engage with men to do so. So I'm um, absolutely clear, women's voices remain critical to advancing gender equality and also eliminating violence against women. But what's also clear is that change will come when men start taking the message of gender equality to other men. That's when systemic change will actually occur. Um, the final thing they've been doing is looking at the issue of domestic violence and why it's a workplace issue. I'm not going to go through it to that in um, detail, but just to say that that's a focus for them this year because what affects employees affects employers and we know that often women who are living in a violent relationship may experience discrimination in paid work and they've got some very innovative strategies um, for dealing with domestic violence as a workplace issue. Um, which we'll be talking about later in the CSW. So thank you very much for inviting me in today. It's been a great pleasure to be here.